Good morning, FBC Blythe, and welcome. So thankful that you chose to worship with us today. But before we get started, we have a few announcements for you. First, we have a new devotional that has started on our Facebook page that's being posted every morning, Monday through Friday. You can check that out at First Baptist Church of Blythe on Facebook. We also have a daily prayer time that's going on live. We'd love to have you join in with us and be a part of that. You can find the link to get on that on our website at fbcblight.com, and that takes place every day at 12 o'clock. Again, just join right in with us on any of the days that you're available for prayer. We also have a Thursday night book study that's happening, and that's at 6 p.m. Uh, you can reach out to Pastor and email him at fbcblight at gmail.com to get the information for that if you'd like to be a part of it. We also have our men's Bible study or men's group still going on every Friday morning at 7, uh, 6 30 a.m. Love to have all you men out there be a part of that and join in with us. That's also taking place on Zoom. All you have to do is go to our website again at fbcblack.com, scroll down towards the bottom, click on that Zoom link, and at 6 30 every Friday morning, you'll be a part of that. And for the kids, we still have several great things happening on Tuesday nights. Mr. Aaron is is doing a thing with Awana and TN Tears. Uh, that's happening live on Facebook. Love to have you be a part of that and check that out. That's at 6 p.m. on Facebook live. Again, that's First Baptist Church of Blythe on Facebook. We also have on Wednesday night is our youth that's going play and taking place. And that's at 7 p.m. every Wednesday night. And that takes place through Zoom. So if you know of any kids uh, or any teenagers that are in 7th grade through 12th grade, uh, please send us an email. Get us a call here at the church so we can get them the information that they need so they can come be a part of that as well. Um, beyond that, we'd like to just uh, take this moment to say we love you guys. We thank you so much for constantly watching these videos and, and uh, being a part of this worship service. And we hope that you're enjoying them. And we continue to pray for you daily. And we want to encourage you to stay in prayer every day. Stay in the word every day. God is faithful and God is good. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Palm Sunday at Blythe First Baptist. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not in the church building. I'm, I'm out in my orchard right now, just really celebrating God's creation, what he's done. Do you know that this this day, this Palm Sunday, this day that we celebrate when Jesus Christ rode in, into Jerusalem was probably the most specifically prophesied date in all of history. In Daniel chapter 9, it gives us the exact number of days it would be until Christ would ride in and be proclaimed king. And only a short time later, they would crucify him. So as we come together today, virtually, wherever we are, we come to worship the risen Savior. We come to worship that Jesus Christ came to save us. And so let's lift this up today in our, in, in our singing, in our prayer, in our time together and visiting with people. Let's pray. Father, we're just grateful to be here. We just ask that everything that we do, we lift up for you wherever we are, in our living room, in our in our orchard, on a tractor, in a car, Father. It doesn't matter. The church united is the body of believers, and we just ask that we lift you up and praise you for, for your protection and for your peace. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Glorify the King of Kings, we will glorify the Lamb, we will glorify 
church this is holy week you know for a fact that in my 14 years of ministry i've never even imagined that i would be speaking to my church from my backyard on a palm sunday morning now this is not just the fact about our church but all around the world i've got friends in india in africa in europe and they're all saying the same thing this is the first time in their lifetime they that they are not going to a physical church inside the four walls of a building coming together to worship God. And folks, you know, that's okay. Through the internet, we have a platform to share God's word that is not restricted inside the four walls of a building. And thank God for technology. Thank God for our young men and women who have got the ability and the know-how to... um, stream these kind of videos into the homes, into your workplaces, into wherever you are right now. So I just want to thank you for being there and listening to this broadcast. Now this week, 2000 years ago, was a momentous week which had earth-shattering significance. Let's look at some of the historic background of this. This is five days before Passover. Jerusalem is teeming with hundreds and thousands of pilgrims from around the Roman world who have come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. According to Josephus, the historian, he says that during this time, Jerusalem would have up to three million people congregate around the temple. You are looking at a huge crowd. By this time, Jesus had become a local celebrity. He obviously had the three years of ministry and the miracles and the healings and everything that he did for these three years. But more than that, what really brought the excitement of the people and what really made them speak about Jesus was the reality that he raised Lazarus from the dead. Some of us know the story. Lazarus had been dead for three days, uh, by four days to be precise, and um, 
obviously the Lord stayed back for this to happen. Mary, Martha and Lazarus were close, very close to Jesus and Jesus arrives in Bethany. Martha comes running to her and, and, and uh, running to him and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother would rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the day. And, and, and Jesus said to her, Martha, look at me. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. A powerful proclamation of the deity of Jesus Christ. And then we know the story. Uh, there was a large crowd that was assembled around the tomb. And Jesus goes over there and he calls Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. Here comes Lazarus with all his grave clothes still attached to him. This was witnessed by all the people who had come over to Mary and Martha's house to comfort them, as well as all the people who heard that Jesus was there doing this miracle. This was an extraordinary event because just imagine this. Jesus calls Lazarus, Lazarus, come out of the grave. Here comes walking Lazarus out of the grave with all his grave clothes wrapped around him. Just imagine the visual impact that this had on all those people who witnessed this scene. So the word of this miracle spread like wildfire. In fact, John 12, 12 says, the large crowd that had come to the Passover heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches of palm leaves and went out to meet him. Now, if you read John's gospel, we see that there is another group of people. They were not really excited about Jesus coming in. They did not want to celebrate his arrival into Jerusalem. They were the chief priests and the religious leaders monitoring the situation with increasing alarm. As far as they were concerned, Jesus was their greatest threat. This kind of public display of support for Jesus was the last thing that they wanted. So as the report of Jesus' popularity came pouring in, they are plotting for ways to get rid of him. Now all the four gospel writers mentioned that people that rallied around Jesus in this procession shouted, Hosanna, 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 blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save us now followed by blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord was obviously from Psalm 118 which every devout Jew knew about. Now Luke specifically mentioned something in 1937 that they were praising God for all the miracles that they had seen. But there is something different that happens over here. Luke mentions that Jesus was soaking in all these praises. This is unusual for Jesus. In fact, we see that in most of his public ministries, after he did a miracle, he specifically instructed the people not to share this with anybody else. It was as if he was shying away from praises and popularity. But today, things are different. He is soaking in all these praises from his people. Why is this? because he is on his way to Calvary. The agony of the cross and the power of the resurrection awaits him. He sees the spiritual significance of this celebration, which I believe probably none of those people around him that were praising him really understood the cosmic significance of what is going on this week. What happens, the Pharisees come to him and urge him to rebuke his disciples for what? For praising him. And Jesus refused saying, If I tell them to be quiet, if I tell them to be quiet, the rocks themselves will break forth in praises to me. Would you believe that? An inanimate object that God created would break forth in praises to his creator. That was the power 
and the cosmic significance of what was going on right there in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday 2000 years ago. Now Luke, the gospel writer, as he mentions in Luke chapter 1 verse 1, who carefully investigated everything, reveals something that the other gospel writers does not mention. At the pinnacle of this celebration, at the pinnacle of this Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And all those rejoicing and people taking off their clocks and laying it on the ground so that the called carrying Jesus can trod over them. In, on, in the middle of all that, Luke mentions that tears flow down Jesus' cheeks. As the procession comes around the southern shoulder of Mount of Olives. If you have been to Jerusalem at that particular point, you will see the whole city of Jerusalem. And it's a breathtaking sight. As soon as Jesus reaches this point, he looks at the city of Jerusalem and starts to cry. Luke puts it in Luke chapter 19, 41 and 42. He says, And when he, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. The Son of God walked with these people. Jesus fed them and did miracles after miracles with these people. He taught them about the kingdom of God. He urged them to repent of their sin and believe in him. And all these things were anchored in his unfailing love, grace and mercy. No one could say, if only you had made things plainer, clearer, we would have believed. No, they rejected him. Jesus invited a decision to be made, but the nation rendered its verdict and rejected him. Jesus' love for his people is expressed in another place in Matthew 23, 37. In fact, his love specifically for Jerusalem. He looks at Jerusalem and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus is saying, if only you had known the things that would bring you peace. Folks, I think this statement is relevant for us today. Imagine this. It takes a deadly virus for us to realize that there are elements in this life that we have absolutely no control of. The world is in anguish and fear. All those markers which we foolishly considered as dispensers of peace and security are suddenly disappearing. Whether it's our jobs, whether it's our retirement plan, whether it's our health, whether it's the reality that we have a school system that is efficient, whether it's a reality that we could go to a grocery store and get the things we need, whether it's uh, the reality that we have a, a church, a physical church where we can go and worship God, all those things are changing. People all over the world are suddenly wanting to turn to something that is real, that is lasting, that is not affected by the ebbs and the flows of a broken world. And the words of Jesus, if only you had known what would bring you real peace. What would bring you real peace? A peace that is not affected by what is going on in this world. A peace that is not affected by the security system that this world or the comfort system that this world can give us. He continues and he says, The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming. Jesus foresaw the day when Israel's enemies will build embankment against them and hem them on every side. He foresaw that there would be Roman soldiers coming in who will dash them to the ground, not only them, but their children within their walls. 
they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This literally happened. The city of Jerusalem was completely destroyed, stone by stone, killing men, women and children in an unprecedented slaughter, exactly as Jesus foresaw. Folks, Jesus understand the grip of sin that Satan has orchestrated this world. He understands the pain that death and disease can bring in our life. He sees the pain and anguish of everything that is going on in this world right now. But this morning, 2000 years ago, on his way to Golgotha, he also saw what the future holds. He saw that this broken world would try to bring the same pain and anguish upon himself, that they would reject him, that they would drag him, beat him to pulp like a common thief, put the burden of a heavy cross on his shoulders and subject him to unimaginable pain. Jesus knew that he had to go through these as the perfect lamb of God who cancels the sin of the people he loves. He knew that by doing this, sin will no longer hold us hostage. He knew that what he did this week would give every believer every believer access to God. He knew that Satan's stronghold will be destroyed and the captives would be set free. He knew that Sunday is coming where the power of grave and death will fail permanently because Jesus will rise from the dead and live victorious with his father. He also knew that because he lives, we will also live. We who believe in him will also live in spite of all that is going on in our lives. Why? Because Jesus paved our approach road. He paved a way for us to be with the Father. And as an investment, as an assurance, as a guarantee of our inheritance, He blessed us with His Holy Spirit that lives in us, which is the voice of God that lives in us. That always assures us that we are sons and daughters of God that always wants us to commune with Him, that always wants us to cry out to Him in our time of need. Folks, let's get to the chase over here. No one can be in the middle forever. You're either for Him and in Him and with Him, or you are against Him, without Him and outside Him. You have to make a decision. You're either believing in Him or you are offended by Him or you are neutral towards Him. You can't be on either one of those situations. For some, Jesus could be part of your vocabulary. You could have been brought up in a Christian family. He could be somebody that you know of, of or even somebody that you talk about. But all those things do not really matter. You see, in Matthew's account, there is this very interesting note. As Jesus approached Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Matthew saw that the whole city was stirred, meaning the whole city was shaken to the core. People began to ask each other, who is this man? And listen to the answers that came. It is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Think about the answer for a moment. It is true as far as it goes. Every detail is correct. Yes, he is a prophet. Yes, he is from Galilee. But he is more than a prophet. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He's more than from Galilee. He is from the beginning, the Word of God, the Word of God. Through Him, all things were created. In Him, all things are held together. So in spiritual things, almost right is not enough, folks. You have to be 100% right. Who is Jesus to you? If He is anything other than your Lord and your Savior, then pause and allow him to be that. When I say a savior, he is not a savior like a lifeguard who saves us from the undertow to hand us over to our loved ones. But he is like our own father who rescues us from the riptide for himself to give us the longest, the sweetest, and the most memorable hug we ever had. His rescue is not like that of a paramedic, a fireman, a police officer or a soldier just doing their honorable job. No, his rescue is much more than that. 
in his rescue, he demonstrates his personal, his covenantal, his sacrificial, his eternal love for us. He rescues us to keep him with him. He doesn't rescue us and put us back in the world. No, he rescues us and he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you till the very end. I will walk with you as you walk through the valley of shadow of death and I will carry you in the palm of my hands. So he's Savior. Now he's also Lord. Meaning, in Him we live, we move, and have our being. He is Lord who not only deserves our obedience in all matters, but also wins our admiration. He's not just the Lord we acknowledge with our taxes and our morality and our Christian jargons, but also with our love and our delight and our perpetual desire to commune with Him, to be in His presence, and to just call Him Abba Father. He is the Lord who is our greatest treasure, a Lord who is so adorable that we will be so glad to sell everything that we have to be his servant. He requires our utmost admiration, our utmost dedication, and our utmost love. And when I say requires, it is not something that we have to do on, on, on term of a legal basis. No, it comes naturally. It comes naturally because that's who we are. The gospel doesn't save those who are interested in Jesus or those who like his teaching or those who talk about one day believing in Jesus. No, the gospel saves those who believe in Jesus. Folks, spiritual neutrality is a temporary rest area, not a permanent destination. No one stays in the rest area forever. Suppose you are going from here to Phoenix and you drop by a rest area, you don't, you don't stay there forever, no. You do your thing, come out, and you still continue your journey. Spiritual neutrality is like you are staying there in the rest area forever. And spiritual neutrality is a temporary rest area. Nobody can stay there forever. Sometimes the reason we do not see the truth is not because we have not read enough books or do not have enough academic knowledge to understand the truth. But the reality is we do not have enough courage. We do not have enough courage right? like the rich young man who came to the Lord and he did not have enough courage to follow the Lord. It takes courage, folks, to believe in Jesus. For that matter, it takes courage to make any important decision in the spiritual realm. Rarely is knowledge the root of our problem. Mostly, we just lack the courage to embrace the truth through faith. And my earnest prayer, my earnest plea for you this morning is if, you, if any one of you listening to me are still in the boundary lines, are still in neutral territory, Make your decision for Jesus Christ. Allow Him to be the Lord and Savior in your life. Watch the difference that will make in your whole being. Experience His peace. Experience His unending fellowship and His love. May your life be led with the hope of eternity and also with the assurance of His constant presence every day, 24-7 in your life. God bless you. I love you, my church. Amen. We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us today. As our closing song is played, please take this moment to reflect on the message and spend time in prayer. If you feel led to give, please visit our website at fbcblythe.com to give online. Checks can also be mailed to P.O. Box 536, Blythe, California, 92225.